Hi, I'm David from DallasDivasDerby.com. Welcome. As you know, we recently held our first ever Dallas Divas Derby Online Brackets game, in which we paired classic female characters from the original Dallas series against each other, so that fans could vote for their favorites in different categories. Over the course of nine rounds of competition and thousands of your votes, we narrowed the pairs down and ultimately crowned our first ever champion, Dallas Diva. The title went to the character of Catherine Wentworth, played by the lovely Morgan Brittany, for five seasons of the original Dallas series. Catherine was the evil half-sister of Pamela Barnes and Cliff Barnes. She came to Dallas, set her sights on Bobby Ewing, and stopped at nothing to get him. We were delighted when Morgan Brittany accepted our invitation to sit down with us to talk about her career and her iconic television character, the villainous Catherine Wentworth, that she helped create. In this first segment, we begin by talking with Morgan about her early career, her favorite roles, and the path that ultimately led her to Dallas. Enjoy. We're happy today to be sitting down with Morgan Brittany, who played Catherine Wentworth for five seasons on the classic Dallas series. Uh, Morgan's character, Catherine Wentworth, uh, recent, was recently voted the champion of the Dallas Divas Derby online game, um, beating out 31 other classic Dallas characters. Um, her character, Catherine, received over 8,000 votes, which was over a third of the total votes cast in the overall game. So it was a pretty much a landslide. <laughs> and we're very happy to be sitting down with Morgan today and have an opportunity to talk about her career and her experiences on Dallas. And we're just very proud to have you here. Thank you. <laughs> it's nice to be here. Yeah. How fun to yeah. be talking about this show. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it's great. We're, we're very happy you're with us. So, as I said, um, you beat out 31 other classic characters, you know. So exciting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was very exciting for us. Um, and I was overwhelmed as I was, you know, doing research the other day and realized that really you got over 30% of like all the votes cast in the game, which was pretty astounding, you know. Our, in, you know, our little, our modest little, you know, grassroots effort here. Um, what do you attribute this enduring fan support and love of Catherine Wentworth? I mean, it's clear that they, that there's big support out there for you. You know what, I, I was thinking about that. And even when I was on the show, there was always this love to hate her mm -hmm. kind of attitude with the public right. and it was it kind of mirrored what JR had mm -hmm. you know where people loved to hate him because he was such a bad guy and they couldn't wait to see what he was going to do next well that was kind of the same thing with Catherine she was so double dealing <laughs> underhanded you know right. and then ended up crazy that I think people had this fascination with her and I think it carried over after I left the show, because I've had so many people throughout the years say, oh, I used to love that character on the show. I love to hate you. Right. And, you know, to have fans remember that mm -hmm. and to really support that character, I thought it was amazing. It was just, it was amazing. So we're going to talk about Dallas in a minute, but before that, I wanted to kind of get back into your uh your or how you began in Hollywood. Oh, we're sitting here in this classic. Many Hollywood. moons ago. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it seems appropriate though, given that we're sitting in this classic Hollywood location downtown I know, LA. I know. And uh, and I loved you know hearing that this is kind of your neighborhood sort of and, and and so. It is. And I think that it's pretty commonly known that some of your first on camera stuff were early episodes of The Twilight Zone when mm -hmm. you were when you were a child actress. But can mm -hmm. you talk maybe about how that began? How you kind of began in Hollywood and. Well, I. Um, I grew up actually not too far from here on 6th Street, um, living in a hotel. My mother was a, a single mom and, you know, we lived with my grandmother in a, in a kind of a tenement hotel, so we had no money. Mm -hmm. And when I was very young, four or five years old, they started uh, putting me in dance classes and modeling schools, things like that. And I started going out and getting agents that would send me out for commercials. Now this was back in the 1950s. Okay. So you think about back then there weren't that many child actors around. Mm -hmm. um, and I started getting little things. I did live television commercials. I did my first one was on the Steve Allen show way oh. back in 1956, 55 or 56. And uh, one thing led to another, and I ended up getting shows like Sea Hunt with mm -hmm. Lloyd Bridges, mm -hmm. The Twilight Zone, Gunsmoke, Rawhide, Outer Limits, and, and things just kept progressing. Mm -hmm. My big break basically came in 1961 when I played Baby June in Gypsy. Right. And that really opened me up to Hollywood, and it was a huge Hollywood musical. Right. And 
then everything just you know went up from there. I did the birds with Alfred Hitchcock, uh, continued on. Um, did uh, the last thing I did before my childhood career was over was mm -hmm. Yours, Mine, and Ours with right. Lucille, with Ball, Lucille and Ball and Henry Fonda. Right. And after that, you know, children didn't really make a good transition back in the 60s. It just kind of ended mm -hmm. when you reached a certain age. You didn't really go through. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what happened to me. Okay. And, uh, you know, it was a pretty hard fall. Sure, I can imagine. Yeah. After being in demand oh, for yeah. all those years. Yeah. yeah. Before we before we jump to that part of it, um, I know that I've I've heard you talk in, in other interviews about your experience on Gypsy. Yes. And uh, your experience. I mean, that was uh, Natalie Wood, Rosalind Russell, Carl Malden. Is yes. That, yeah. That's, that's, that's it. some pretty great. Amazing. Great names. Directed by Mervyn Leroy. Yeah. 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 And yeah. Um, and I have heard that you've had sort of you sort of admired Natalie Wood as a kid when you I were did. you were on set. Um, do you have any memories from that experience? I have amazing memories <laughs> of her. They're just, uh, I used to think she was the most beautiful person I had ever seen in my life. We would rehearse. We rehearsed for 10 solid weeks, okay. uh, the dance numbers and the singing numbers. I mean, they wanted perfection on that film. Mm -hmm. And we, we rehearsed in a little house on the back lot. Uh, that later became the Dukes of Hazard set, oh, really? believe it or not. <laughs> <clears throat> One of those houses. And uh, every day we'd go into the house. The kids would work in the morning, and then we'd take a break in the afternoon, and Natalie would come in and okay. rehearse her scenes, right. her dance numbers, and she wouldn't let anybody watch. <laughs> so all of us had to stay outside. Well, the kids would go and play, but I'd go and I'd look through the window, and I'd watch <laughs> her through the window because I thought she was so gorgeous, and she would come in with Warren Beatty. They mm -hmm. were dating at the time. Oh, yeah. And she would watch me rehearse, She'd be sitting on Warren's lap with her cigarette, you know, <laughs> nice. and she, she was a chain smoker uh -huh. and she'd just sit there for hours and watch me rehearse, but she wouldn't let me watch her. <laughs> but I did peek through the window and um, I did, I did see Natalie, uh, didn't really understand it at the time, but looking back on it now, she was very insecure playing mm -hmm. that role. Mm -hmm. um, she didn't think she could do it. She didn't think she could you know, handle the strip tease kind of thing because right. she's very small, very thin and very small, uh. and she was very insecure. And I saw this part of her that, uh, you know, the public really never saw. So it was kind of interesting. Yeah, kind I, of an intimate view. Yeah, kind of an intimate view. I saw that on a lot of things that I did throughout mm -hmm. the movie industry. Uh, saw people for who they really were mm -hmm. uh, outside of the persona that the public thought they were. Sure. Yeah. At a very young age. At a very young age. So that, that had to be yeah. very informative to it you. It was. It okay. was. It taught me a lot of things. It taught me what I wanted to be like and what I didn't want to be like mm -hmm. as an actor. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. And similarly, you had, um, uh, I mean, everyone, everyone loves the birds. Oh, everyone, yeah. Everyone loves, you know, <laughs> I've heard you talk about, you know, the, some of the scenes with the actual birds before. Oh, yeah. I mean, it sounded yeah. like it was a little bit crazy and very low tech. Oh yeah, yeah like, we didn't have special effects like they do now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, do you have? How was that working within those scenes with the birds? It was it was very uh, dicey. It yeah. really was. It yeah. was uh, you know when we were up in Bodega Bay, those were real birds. Those were live seagulls that they threw at us at the birthday party sequence. <laughs> uh, you know, I Can't mean, imagine. they were just caught off an island and monofilament was put you know tied to their feet and they were thrown at the kids. We didn't know where these birds were going. We didn't know what was going to happen. There were some mechanical. There were sure. some hand puppets and mm -hmm. things like that. But there was nothing like they have today. You sure. know, there was no computer graphic, really, right. to you know, do anything like that. Right. But uh, it was quite an experience. Um, my dealings with Hitchcock, he was interesting because he singled me out. And I remember him talking to my mother and telling her, you must make her a blonde. You must make her a blonde. Oh she she will grow up to be like Grace Kelly. You must make her. My mother's like, no, I don't think so. <laughs> and then he hired me again later on in a film that he did called Marnie. Mm -hmm. And um, my scene ended up on the cutting room floor. Oh. But uh, he had this fascination, even as a, when I was such a little girl, mm -hmm. that he could see kind of this 
you know, what I was going to be like mm -hmm. later on. And he was so fascinated with Chippy Hedron. We right. don't even want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> don't even want to go well, there. I was about to say, and he's also <clears throat> kind of fascinated with blondes. Oh, so, he, yeah. was. He's so, he was. He's trying to Absolutely. convert you early, I think. <laughs> I think so, yeah. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. That's great. I didn't know that about Marnie. That's interesting that, yeah. that, was, yeah. that that came up as well. So in 1967, you did uh, a classic episode of The Andy Griffith Show, Opie's yeah. First Love. You played Ron <laughs> Howard's first girlfriend. I did. And, um, you know, I wondered if you had any memories from that. And given that we just we just lost Andy Griffith recently, uh, yeah. who was beloved by so many, and that show is such classic, such a classic show. If you had any memories of him or of the show working on that episode? It was it was great. As a child actor, you know, I bounced around from one show to another. One week I was doing a Western, the next week I was doing sci-fi, then I'd go over to Andy Griffith's show. Um, it, it was, that show was so much fun. It was kind of like Dallas was in that it was a family. Everybody knew their characters, everybody knew what they were doing. And when I walked in to do that episode, um, Andy was just as nice and warm and friendly and just like he, just like he was on, on camera, you know, and, and he treated Ron just like his own son. I mean, that was, that was the great thing about it, is that it was such a warm atmosphere to be in. And Andy, you know, I had always watched his old movies. I think he did that movie, Face in the Crowd, where he was phenomenal. He was a phenomenal actor. And many, many people don't understand what kind of depth he had as an actor, but they need to see that film because he was wonderful in it. And he created, you have to remember, Andy of Mayberry was such a staple in our lives and such a, a, a strong presence on television for so many years. To this day, I'll go back to Mayberry days in uh, Mount Airy, North Carolina. Okay. People from all over the world come and they talk and they and they, they talk about memories of Andy Griffith's show and they'll run the old footage from the shows. The shows still stand up even to today. They're funny, they're heartwarming, they're part of this country's fabric that people want to hold on to. Mm -hmm. And I think Andy Griffith inspired that in everybody. He is kind of the epitome of what, sort of what America is. Mm -hmm. that's, what, that's what he reminds me of. And he was just like that. He was a wonderful man and it's a, it's a great loss. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're losing so many wonderful people, mm -hmm. but they're leaving behind such a legacy. Great, le great legacy. They and really like are. Like you said, in film, in stage, Absolutely. and television. Absolutely, in, in everything case. that they do, and they leave such a mark mm -hmm. on all of us. I mean, we'll never forget. Yeah. Well, thank you for that memory. I know that it, he, he just passed away, and it's it's nice to be able to get your experience yeah. being wonderful. on the show. And you'll always be Opie's first love. I will. <laughs> <laughs> Forever. <laughs> It'll make up for killing Bob. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Um, and so, and, and then we get to 1968, Yours, Mine, and Ours, and yes. I've heard you talk a little bit about Lucille Ball and mm -hmm. how professional she oh, was yeah. on set, and yeah. you know, I'm a, I'm a Lucy fan from way back. I'm, I'm interested to hear more about that a little bit, about her work ethic and her, you said mm. that she was just, regardless of everyone's background, she was just very professional with everyone. She was. Um, she was, outside of Gene Kelly, who I worked with in Las Vegas as a dancer, oh, okay. um, oh. I did a show at the, it was the, called then the International Hotel, okay. and I was a, a dancer in his show. Outside of Gene Kelly, Lucy was one of the toughest people I think I've ever worked with. Really? Yes. Uh, she did not, she did not accept anything except perfection no matter what age you were. And if you remember on Yours, Mine, and Ours, mm -hmm. we had 18 kids on that show. Right. And they went from babies all the way up. Well, she demanded professionalism from every age group. You did not mess up. Wow. You did not mess up her scene. When that, when that camera was rolling and she was on, you better be on your game. Wow. And if you weren't on your game, you were called out on it no matter what age you were. Wow. So. Lucy, I learned from her that if you want the film to turn out the way you want it, you've got to know everybody's job. Mm -hmm. She knew everybody's job. She knew how to direct. She knew her camera angles. She knew lighting, mm -hmm. makeup, hair, wardrobe, 
even down to props. She wow. knew everything. Nobody on that set knew more than Lucy did. And it was, it was amazing. And everyone else stood back, even Henry. Mm -hmm. Henry Fonda just kind of, hey, you know, let her do what she had to do. <laughs> right. And Mel Shavelson, who was the director, he stood back. I mean, everybody deferred to Lucy. How was that as a child actor? I mean, was that intimidating? Was that... Uh, it was in the beginning. Mm -hmm. it, it, it was because you knew you didn't mess around. Right. And there was no messing around right. on that set. You could imagine with 18 kids how, yeah. you know, what a riot that could <laughs> right, have been. Right, right, right. It wasn't. Right, we, sure. I mean, everybody was a professional. Everybody oh, did their job. And the movie came out, you know, extremely well. Great chemistry. Mm -hmm. So she was, she was tough, though. I yeah. mean, I can't. You know, I, <laughs> I, I must admit, you just had to toe the line. Did you, just out of curiosity, um, later in your career, when you have had your adult <laughs> acting career, uh -huh. did you take any of that approach with you in any of your projects in terms of being aware of everybody's role and being aware of, oh, yeah. you know, did you, did you, did stuff rub off from Lucy? <laughs> yeah, it really did. Yeah. Um, it, it, it made me so much more aware of the other actors on the show as well. And I, I, when I starred in Glitter for Aaron Spelling, I didn't have as much tolerance for people who would come in late, who wouldn't mm -hmm. know their lines, who would, I didn't have as much because I remembered how she kept, you know, demanding professionalism. This is your job. This is what you're paid for. This is what you're here for. Right. We owe this to the public that are going to pay tickets for this. And I think I carried that through because even later on when I did a show, I did Melrose Place mm -hmm. for, for a few episodes and um, I hadn't been working all that much mm -hmm. and I came back into television and it kind of shell shocked me in a way mm -hmm. because it was so laid back <laughs> that many of the actors, they didn't really care whether they hit their mark. They didn't care whether they, they're like, oh, what's my, what, what is this scene again? Uh, where, what am I like? <laughs> you know, and, and it kind of shocked me in a way mm -hmm. that the professionalism was sort of going away. And I, I don't know, I, I learned so much from Lucy and I always felt you do owe that to your public. You right, owe that right. to the people who are going to watch this forever. And it sounds like owe it to the people <clears throat> that you're working with, Absolutely. too. It's respect for, Absolutely. for everyone's role. That's you know, I mean, I remember uh, one of the uh, <laughs> poor camera guy, he's going, cast, could you at least attempt to hit your mark so I know where to light you? Could you maybe just try? <laughs> wow. <laughs> I thought, wow. Lucy you wouldn't know. approve. <laughs> no, 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 no. You would be, you would be gone. You would right. be out of there. Wow. But her work ethic was uh, <clears throat> something really to be admired. Well, it's just interesting. Since you started so young, you got this, this insight into, I don't know, I don't want to use the term old Hollywood, but, but the more formal kind of work ethic of that area. I mean, you've transcended several mm -hmm. decades, and so you've really seen it evolve. <clears throat> right. You know, so it's interesting, the, these observations, you know, later on in the 90s versus, you know, the experience in the 60s. It's, it's a whole different <clears throat> game today. Mm -hmm. it, it really is. Uh, it's, it's not, I don't know, I, I, I just see such a difference from mm -hmm. working back in the 60s and even the 70s, even when we did Dallas. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody you know, as much as we goofed around and we had fun on the show, mm -hmm. uh, everybody knew their job. Everybody knew exactly what they were supposed to do. I've heard that from yeah. in other interviews from other actors that one of the, and we'll get into some Dallas stuff in more detail shortly, but mm -hmm. just that idea that the, the key characters, you know, they could hit their mark beneath their lines. They showed up prepared. And, Absolutely. And that made, it sounds like that made the horsing around possible. <laughs> that's right. Because that's when right. it was ready to roll, everyone <clears throat> could deliver. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. So, um, so then you left California and went to New York. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And clarify for me. I, I know that there was you changed your name and, I did. and you moved to New York. Was that before you went to New York? Was that part of the move to New York, the transition, or was that um, prior to that? I. <laughs> it's so funny. 
I don't know. It was it was crazy. I was toying with changing my name because I knew I was getting absolutely nowhere with mm -hmm. the childhood name and the and the resume. I mean, sure. I'd go in and agents would would look at the resume and go, "Gypsy, yours, mine, and ours." Seriously, <laughs> I mean, nobody's gonna hire you. You're right. a kid actor. Right. And I thought, okay, well, what choice have I got? Mm -hmm. And um, I knew I had to get out of Hollywood. And I thought, well. I'll just take what I have. And at that point, you know, my money had been spent. Mm -hmm. I supported the family, so wow. I had no money really. And I had a, a, a car that I sold <laughs> to get myself a plane ticket and to last for a month in New York to see if I could make it. Right. And I had, um, I was really into romance novels. This is the most, I mean, you talk about something out of the twilight zone. <laughs> I'm serious. This this really happened. Um, I was very much into romance novels and I mm -hmm. used to love an author by the name of Frank Yerby. Mm -hmm. And he wrote, uh, you know, Southern romance novels in the 1940s. Southern Bells. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Southern Bells. And of course I had always had this fascination with Scarlett O'Hara and Vivian right. Lee and all that. And I, um, I was in an old secondhand bookstore and I, I had bought this, I saw this book, and it was called Flood Tide. And I picked it up, and I opened it, and the very first paragraph was, Morgan Brittany was mistress of such and such a plantation. And I went, wow, I love that name. I wonder if I could get away with that, you know? And I thought about it and thought about it. And when I got on the airplane with my ticket, as Suzanne Capito, mm -hmm. I made that choice. I got off that airplane in New York City as Morgan Brittany. Wow. And I never looked back. You know, back then with no internet, no, no nothing, it was very easy. You could just go and if you called yourself something, mm -hmm. you know, you could open a bank account, you could do whatever. You know, I mean, that, it was very easy. So I established myself as Morgan Brittany. Um, I started making the rounds uh, with the agencies and the ad agencies and bluffing my way in and, <laughs> you know, telling people, I've never done anything before. I'm right out of school. <laughs> <You know>? Wow. <clears throat> and um, I threw out the resume. I threw out the past. And I, of course, all these people, it was so funny because in New York City, when I'd go in, I'd bluff my way into ad execs, mm -hmm. you know, casting people's offices mm -hmm. by telling the secretary, I'm here from, I'm in from California, and the William Morris office told me to drop by and say hello to so-and-so. <laughs> <laughs> These girls would go, really, do you have an appointment? No, I'm only here for a day, but I wanted to stop and say hi. <laughs> Sometimes it worked, and I got in, wow. and once I got in the door, I would say to the casting person, listen, while I'm here, let me read some copy for you if anything comes up and you think I'm right for it. And they were kind of like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so That's I'd amazing. read copy and they'd sit there and go, you've never done anything before? And I'm going, no. Go, well, you're a natural. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I so bluffed my way. Wow. I so bluffed my so way. So you were an overnight sensation. <laughs> yeah, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, and exactly. when the story came out, after I got on Dallas, the mm -hmm. story came out. Okay. Because before that, nobody knew. And it was almost like, whoa, you really did that? I said, yeah, I really did that. <laughs> it felt safe enough when you landed in um, Dallas where you could let that story I out. know. It well, the press that... started asking me, okay. you know, what happened and how did all this come about? And okay. so all these stories started coming out. Okay. So I, I've heard, you know, different versions of the story of, of the Vivian Lee connection. Yeah. And yeah. how ultimately that, that I think got your audition <clears throat> for Dallas or led yes. to your audition yes. for Dallas. Now, were there two or three times that you had played Vivian Lee? Three times. Okay. And was the yes. first, was it Day of, Day the, of the Locust? Day of the Locust, John Schlesinger, right? right? And, and, and then, then uh, Gable yeah, and Lombard. Gable and Lombard, and then Moviola. Moviola. Right. Mm -hmm. So how did the first, how did, how did Day of the Locust happen? How did Day of the Locust was an open call at Paramount Studios. Uh, came out in the Hollywood Reporter or Variety that they were looking for celebrity lookalikes mm -hmm. from the 1940s. Mm -hmm. And I had nothing to lose. I went, what the heck? I'll go as Vivian Lee, you know. Right. And when I went over there, it was, of course, a cattle call, and there were a million people there. And I walked into the room, 
and I believe John Schlesinger and there were a couple of other people that were in there and they just went, wow, for the <laughs> premiere scene, she's perfect. We need to find a Laurence Olivier, but she's perfect. Getting out of a limo, getting out, I mean, right. a little bitty thing, right, you know. Right. But yeah, and so I was in, I worked on that whole big riot scene at the wow. end and they, you know, they dressed me in all these fabulous clothes and, and it, was, it was great, but that kind of started me thinking, mm -hmm. you know, maybe I should go with this. Mm -hmm. Maybe I should really capitalize on this Scarlett O'Hara, Vivian Lee kind of thing. Right. And I would go out on commercials and I'd have that same look and people really responded to it. Mm -hmm. Well, when Moviola came along, I was, I had done, I had really done a lot of big movies at that time for television, movies of the week. And so I had a pretty good name established by okay. then. And my agency, when this came along, uh, they said, hey, we got a call. They really would like for you to do this little thing in Moviola. It's just at the end of the movie. We don't think you should do it. It's a nothing role. It's not going to help you. There's no money in it. And I said, well, what is it exactly? And they said, well, it's the search for Scarlett O'Hara. And at the very end, <clears throat> she shows up and takes the hat off and it's the burning of Atlanta and I said I want to do that are you <laughs> kidding me I said that's the climax of the whole movie no 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 you you you're way beyond that you've started an ABC movie of the week you've had your own pilots you've done this I said guys listen to me I want to do this and I said number one I said I don't care about the money the money doesn't matter to me I said here's what I want you to do I want you to get me separate card credit that says, and introducing Morgan Brittany as Vivian Lee. I said, that's what I want you to do. And they went, okay, you know, we really think this is the wrong choice. Best choice I ever made in my life. It sounds like pretty sick. Best choice I ever made because, because of that role, when that movie came out, I, my picture was on the cover of every supplemental TV guide across the country. Morgan Brittany as Vivian Lee. People put a name to the face that they had seen for years on Ultra Bright right. and Levi's <laughs> and Ford. <laughs> right. They didn't know who I was, now they did. Right. That came to the attention of the Dallas people. Okay. All, it, just, it just dominoed, just right. like that. And it really was meant to be, I think. And they were looking for a sister for Pam, yeah, you know, which was a tiny seven-episode arc. That yeah. was it.